Hello, everybody. Uh, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I just sent a little message in the chat about our, our CO option that allows you to communicate with us. Um, when you open it up, um, there should be an option to, there's like a little a phone image there and you should be able to ask questions or make statements. One, there's one option at the top that says it's a Q&A and the other one is a poll. You can enter either one to keep track of that for you. Um, but to start, my name is Laura Starrett and I'm here to support Tierra Thomas and Beth Shoemaker in leading this discussion on reparative description cataloging. To start, just some basic um, information on behalf of the SGA Education Committee. To start, as SGA does not tolerate harassment in any form. Um, in keeping with the core principles outlined in our statement on diversity and inclusion and the SAA's Code of Ethics for Archivists, SGA is committed to providing a harassment-free environment for its members and participants, regardless of age, color, creed, disability, family relationship, gender identity or expression, individual lifestyle, marital status, national origin, physical appearance, race, religion, sex, sexual orientation, or veteran status. Harassment may include um, direct or indirect abusive verbal comments, um, messages, or discriminatory images in public spaces, deliberate intimidation, stalking, harassment, photography, or recording, sustained disruption of talks or other events, inappropriate physical contact, and unwelcome sexual uh, attention. If you refuse to stop harassing behavior, you will be expelled from this workshop and you must be you must appeal to the SGA board for uh, inclusion in other um, events. Please reach out to me during this workshop if you feel that you are being harassed. The content presented during the workshop may at times deal with sensitive subject matter ranging from visually sensitive historical material to sexually explicit material or images. This policy is not intended to constrain scholarly or professional presentation or discourse. Um, or debate as long as these exchanges are conducted in a respectful manner. Now, usually recordings of the SGA's workshops will be uploaded to the SGA YouTube page between one to two months following the day of the workshop. Primary consent of the session, the presentations by Tira and Beth, will be included in that recording. However, we will ask for a consensus on recording the breakout sessions. We have volunteers from the education committees take notes during those sessions, so even if we decide not to record the breakouts, we will have a record of the content that can be shared. We also appreciate you not sharing sensitive information that is discussed in this workshop, especially information put out by your fellow participants. Links from this slide that you see here can be found in the chat and I'll put them in there shortly. And I will ask everyone to either hold their questions for the Q&A or you can use the Slido link that I've linked to in the chat as well. Um, make sure that your microphones are muted um, and also make sure your microphone is not muted when you do need to speak. And let me put these slides in here for you. Now, before I begin, I would also like to read a land labor acknowledgement um, created in part by one of our presenters today, Tierra Thomas, along with Brooke Suka and Nicole Poluski, along with some of the language from um, Emory University's acknowledgement. We would like to acknowledge that the land that we stand on is indigenous land and therefore rightly belongs to those from whom it was stolen. We named the Muscogee Creek people who lived, worked, produced knowledge on, and nurtured the land known as the Atlanta metro area. We thank them um, for allowing us to be here today, though in 1821, the Muscogee were forced to relinquish this land. We recognize the sustained oppression, land disposition, and involuntary removals of the Muscogee and, Ch and Cherokee peoples from Georgia and the Southeast, and seek to honor the Muscogee Nation and other indigenous caretakers of this land by humbly seeking knowledge of their histories and committing to respectful stewardship of this land. In addition, we acknowledge the enslaved people who labor built the universities that we work for and represent, and the hurt and suffering inflicted on those individuals, their communities, and their descendants. In addition, at the bottom of the slide, um, we, I want to point out, and yes, the slides will also be sent to you after the presentation, um, the links, especially Reclaiming Native Truth, which is an Emory University initiative, as well as some current news about the work of the Muscogee tribe. And so to kind of get into the starting, um, this will be a pretty fast paced workshop with a few breaks, but I do hope that we've given enough time um, that early finishes will allow for some unscheduled moments of peace. Here's the agenda that we are hoping to follow. So I'll give you a few moments to screen grab this and I'll also try to post this in the chat after the introduction. Um, so you'll have that as well. I shall do it right now. So right now we are currently in our um, introductory phase. And, sorry, I'm putting in the agenda. 
We're currently in our introductory phase, um, which will lead to talks by our two presenters, followed by breakout sessions that will get our hands a little dirty with some practical work. We'll return to a group setting to go over our thoughts and questions for the final 30 minutes for a wrap up. Um, so our two presenters today are Tiara Thomas and Beth Shoemaker, and I've had the, the honor to work with both of them during my time at Rhodes Library at the Emory University. I consider myself honestly very lucky to have met both of these people. Tiara Thomas is an early career archivist living in Decatur, Georgia. She earned her MSLS at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill School of Information and Library Science. As an undergraduate, she studied history and African-American studies at Georgia State University in Atlanta. Most recently, she just finished a contract as the visiting archivist for Southern Jewish Collections at Emory University. She has served as a member of the anti-oppressive um, language working group at Emory University, and also as a member of the Conscious Editing Steering Committee at UNC Chapel Hill Schools and Library. Her research focuses on social justice and equity, and centering those ideals in archival settings. Beth Shoemaker is the Rare Book Librarian at Emory University's Stuart A. Rose Manuscript Archives and Rare Book Library in Atlanta. Her work includes cataloging, collection development, teaching, and curating events and exhibits across the, the Emory libraries. Her research interests include how practicing catalogers approach ethics in the workplace. Since its formation in 2018, she has been a co-chair of the Cataloging Ethics Steering Committee, which released the final draft of the Cataloging Code of Ethics in January of 2021. Beth is a graduate of the University of Illinois Graduate School of Library and Information Science. And I'm here as representing SGA's Education Committee as their moderator. My work as a processing archivist brings me face to face with issues of description and access all the time. So I was incredibly excited to have the opportunity to bring this workshop. Uh, I'm gonna start off with a brief explanation to get everyone onto the same basic level. So our workshop leaders have the opportunity to go a little more in depth and practical with their selections. So we're going to start with what does reparative archives mean or reparative description. And if we're going to do that, we kind of have to start with the Society of American Archivists Glossary. Reparative description aims to rectify the centuries of mishandling of the historic record by centering the underserved communities whose records we hold in an effort to ensure that these stories are told from a place of equity. Whether we call it reparative description or anti-oppressive language or harmful language remediation or anti-racist speech, all of these terms are separated by degrees and more or less these concepts work to ensure that archives and libraries are not continuing a cycle of demeaning, harming, or demoralizing people by using inaccurate language or search terms. And the ways we can do this um, are by decentering the librarian and archivist. So I'm going to make my own personal statement here that I am a cisgendered white woman and that I have benefited from a systemically racist society that gives me privilege based solely on my race and socioeconomic background. I have bias. Acknowledging any of this does not make me an inherently bad person. It simply is the first step to improving myself in order to do this type of work well. And speaking of bias, I would also like to, I like most other um, archivists and catalogers, rely on the Library of Congress um, along with other assorted thesauri and with historically little effort to confront the harmful language or the inherently political atmosphere of the Library of Congress. In addition, archivists use minimal processing and take for granted language of our donors or creators of the material. We might put those titles in quotes or mention the language's origin in our finding aid notes, but we still uphold it by including that language and making our users interact with antiquated, harmful, in some cases, by bigoted language. Comparative archives and comparative description helps us identify the undercurrent of charged language and understand that language can work as a dog whistle and how other harmful language continues to cause damage through its unmediated use. Confronting the language and how people search is probably the first step in creating equity in the historical record. Now, going back to personal bias that I mentioned in the last slide, the comparative description is bound in identifying why we describe the way we do. I recommend taking a look at Harvard University's Project Implicit to gauge your own personal biases after the workshop, of course. Um, and through this workshop, we hope to give you the skills to challenge your own biases and change how you're making your decisions. We hope we all get a little more comfortable being a little uncomfortable and engaging with that feeling in a meaningful and forward moving way. What reparative description is not is it's not just lip service and it's not laying blame at people. Reparative description and cataloging uses inclusive language and terms that allow all of our researchers to access our materials without facing harmful language in our description. But it's important to know that it's not about blaming people for the actions of the past. 
We're not taking white out to historical documents. We are not looking to erase history. In many cases, it is beneficial to be transparent about what we as archivists and librarians have done or what our organizations have done and how we are mediating the oppressive language and structures in our own works. When you start to think about it, um, we can pull our users from everywhere. I told friends to just go into special collections and ask about seeing something. So we need to consider that people can come into our, our organizations with absolutely no background in historical context. We could have K through 12 students or new college freshmen. Um, and the first thing that they may come face to face with is some kind of oppressive language. And then we've lost them. Because librarians are seen as these authorities in descriptive language and search, um, that we have the power to use language to change how people look for knowledge or how they see the world and how they see their place in the world. So we create metadata that an alg algorithm reviews. So we decide what comes up when people are doing a search. And if we are, in fact, the keepers of the access points, we need to do better to ensure that language is not only accessible to researchers, but also respectful. Um, I do want to end um, this introduction with a script that I pulled from Dr. Tafina Lazarus Stewart's Language of Appeasement article. Reparative work is being done in so many different sectors of our society, and this particular example comes from the academic world. But I think the personification and discussion um, gets it what the work of reparative description and cataloging is trying to do. The first step in implementing reparative description is to acknowledge that it is needed. Dr. Stewart poses the this, uh, this scenario where diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice personified are sitting in a room, and diversity poses a question, who's in the room? And equity responds with, who's trying to get into the room? Inclusion asks, um, has everyone's ideas been heard? And justice responds, whose ideas won't be taken seriously because they aren't in the majority? Diversity poses the question, how many voices do we have this year? How many more voices do we have this year than we did last? And equity responds with, how are we making, how are we maintaining traditional majorities? And to point out what I always kind of feel is the heart of our work in archivists and in catalogers in the historical record, um, inclusion asks, is this environment safe to feel, is it safe for everyone to feel like they belong? And justice challenges whose safety is being sacrificed and minimized in order to allow others to feel comfortable maintaining their dehumanizing views. So besides the best options to create access for the most people, why are we doing this? Um, we owe it to our researchers to limit the hurdles when we can and create supportive environments for those who are doing research with our collections. In addition, we are a representation of our organization and sorry, we are a representation of our organizations and in creating these supportive research spaces, we enhance the reputations of our organizations and many of which have proven to have historically poor racial histories. What you'll learn in the next few hours will help you tackle these big pictures, um, big picture, picture issues, from background on how we got here to policies and standards and breaks from standards, um, that information um, professionals are undertaking right now. So I do want to introduce Tira Thomas to start us off um, with the, the, the meat and potatoes of this, this presentation. I'm going to unshare my screen and allow her to share her screen. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Laura. That was really great. Um, yeah, thank you, Laura. Thanks to the Education Committee and everybody who organized this and for inviting me to talk about the Anti-Oppressive Language Working Group um, at Emory. Um, so, hello, I'm Tierra. Before we um, really get into it, though, I just wanted to kind of feel the room because we're all not together. So. It's hard to tell what everybody is like, what the energy is. So I was just, if you could drop in the chat how you're feeling maybe about the workshop today or just how you're feeling about today in general, just keeping in mind that we are recording, maybe don't drop anything super personal, but just let me know how you're feeling. How are you today? Um, uh, I will share myself that, um, I don't know, I, I think I'm feeling pretty enthusiastic and optimistic that there are so many people here um, interested in doing this kind of thing. Um, let's see if I can find the chat. Yeah, great. I'm seeing excited, enthusiastic, eager to learn, hopeful and excited. 
Lots of excited. Good. Okay. Yeah, somebody said they feel like they could be doing much more. Yes, hopefully today we'll get some tools to do that. Someone <laughs> will have nervous in the orange range. Okay, great. Well, that's good. I feel like we're in a good, the vibe is good. Okay. Um, so yeah, it's so nice to meet all of you and to be here. Um, Laura did already give my background, but I just, I guess, wanted to still talk about myself more. I think it's good to know who you're hearing from. Um, so yeah, um, I'm Tiara. I'm here in Decatur, early career archivist. I just finished up a project at Emory and I just recently started working at the Columbia Theological Seminary where I'm an archives assistant. Um, and I've just been really passionate about um, diversity in archives and since I started at library school, I think one of the things that really got me excited about this work was an essay session about um, reparative description way back in 2018. Um, and I'm, I, it's cited here in this presentation. Um, and yeah, I think this work is probably personal to so many of us. Um, and that's why I just want to state my own positionality as a Black queer woman, that um, I find a lot of this work to be kind of healing. And I feel like, um, you know, it's just an opportunity to make something right somewhere in some way and make things more equitable, um, even if it you know, some people feel like it's just language, but I think it really does do a lot more than just. So uh, yeah, you're taking an important step in being here today and I'm just so happy that you're all here with me. So um, yeah, at Emory, I got to be on the anti-oppressive working, language working group. And it was something I was so excited to get the opportunity to be a part of and that's what I'm gonna be talking about today. So I'm just gonna start off by talking about what it was and then just, I'm just gonna get right into the meat and potatoes of it. And I'm so sorry if you hear weird noises. I have an 11 month old puppy and I think we're having a good day so far, but um, she is currently just going a little crazy. Um, I'm gonna talk about the research process and I'm gonna talk about, um, how we created the guide and I'll get into the different parts of it. Um, so yeah, so before we really get there, I did want to also assess how everyone is feeling about anti-oppressive language. What does that mean to you? Laura gave us a really great um, definition about reparative description, a really great primer about it, but I think it would be good if we could get an idea of what everyone is thinking about it. Um, so I just wanna direct you to Poll Everywhere uh, where we can make a little word cloud together. And I can drop this link uh, down below. And if you are having trouble getting to it, maybe you're already on your phone. Um, or you, your device can't really get to a browser right now, you could also drop your answer in the chat, but I thought it'd be cool to make a word cloud together. So I'm gonna stop sharing my presentation. Okay, yeah, we got a lot of great stuff going here.
I love to see healing there, really big, respectful, thoughtful, active, diversity, allyship. Yeah, user, user, user inclusion. Equity. Inequalities work yeah honesty choice those are the big ones narrative context okay great i think these are all really great um words um great definitions okay let's go back to the presentation So yeah, I think that there's not, uh, there's many definitions of um, anti-oppressive language. And I think definitely all the words that we came up with there fit into that definition. Um, so I just wanna talk about the uh, anti-oppressive language working group now. Um, and I wanna start off by shouting out to my colleagues who are all part of the group. Um, which was Sarah Quigley, Lolita Roll, um, Gina DuVernay, and Carrie Hintz, and myself. Um, they're such a great group to work with and um, write this guide with. And there was work that happened obviously before I was there. And I'm sure there's work happening after I've been there. So lots of remediation work and things. So um, definitely just amazing work happening at Rose Library. So yeah, what the group is, is a group dedicated to improving existing and to be created collection descriptions in order to make archival materials more accessible and equitable. Um, so yeah, literally just a group dedicated to um, analyzing what is found in our finding needs and how it might uh, be more geared towards a certain group of people and harmful to many marginalized groups of people. So we're talking about people of color, disabled people, queer people, um, trans people. Um, so basically um, looking at the languages there and figuring out how uh, it might need to be changed or how it might need to be contextualized um, in order to not uphold oppression in society any further. And I put here what it is in. It's not language policing, you know, sometimes it can feel like, oh, you know, we're telling people they can't, they can't say certain things. They can't um, talk about things a certain way. And that's just, that's not what it is. It's really just more saying, well, um, we're speaking about this in this way, and it would probably be better if we said it in this way. Um, it's not the end all be all. I mean, language is constantly changing. Um, we're coming up with new slang words every day. We're adding new words to the dictionary every year. Um, so the other thing is that this is a process that is ongoing over time. So really any guide that we create or that you create, you have to keep in mind that it's not going to cover every single thing that's out there. And it's also not gonna cover every single thing that's out there forever and ever. <laughs> um, and it might not be the exact right thing for everyone. I mean, language remediation might work really well um, in one repository and that just might remove you know, remediating language might remove a lot of context in another repository. So um, maybe at the end of this presentation, you realize, I don't know that creating a guide is right for me, but hopefully there are some takeaways you could come away from it and there would be another tool that would work better for you or a type of group that would work better for you. 
Um, so yeah, uh, getting into how it really all started was it just started with recognizing that there were some sticky areas. Now, I feel like Emery's holdings at the Rose Library, um, there are there is remediation to be done, and I I do think the glaring examples are not as glaring as it might be in other repositories. Um, but there are some things that are kind of sticky, like for example here. This is a miscellany collection about African Americans in sports. Um, so this was about an autograph book and a photograph album. Now this might read as a problem language for one person and it might read as completely fine for somebody else and that's okay. Um, but basically it says here, the autograph album contains signatures from African American sports figures, including some from the Negro Leagues. So just basically questioning whether or not Negro Leagues was the best term to use. Should it have been in quotations? Um, should there have been more information about that? Maybe there is another source that we could guide our researchers to so that they understand why that was used or why that's the preferred term or the correct term. Um, here's another kind of possibly sticky one. Um, this is a collection about um, W.L. Trask, who is a Civil War veteran. So it just talks about, you know, he was a steamboat pilot living in Louisiana when the Civil War began. Early in the war, he was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the Sumter Grays of New Orleans. In the autumn of 1861, he commanded the river steamer charm in Confederate campaigns on Columbus, Kentucky, and Belmont, Missouri. So, I mean, that's okay. Um, but I think maybe some of the language could be considered maybe a little too flowery, you know, a little um, too, uh, Just a, just a little too much fluff around what the actual meat and potatoes of the collection is that we're talking about a Civil War veteran. Okay, so I, I just wanna talk about the research process that kind of led up to all of this um, because that is important to kind of do your reading, know what's out there before just fully jumping into this without a lot of, without much guiding background knowledge, it's good to know what's out there and what's going on. So this is just some of the work that um, really guide the, um, the anti-oppressive language work. Um, this is directly from the guide. So uh, this will be, this will be shared after the the presentation so you'll have access to this but uh, I just wanted to bring attention to these sources just a couple of them from there because they all are just very different resources and I guess that's one really important thing that I wanted to bring up is that um, you know when it comes to creating whatever kind of rules are well, whatever kind of guidelines you might want to follow for your repository is looking to looking at different um, organizations, maybe outside of libraries. You want to look inside of libraries too, but just all the different places that people are talking about how they refer to be, how they prefer to be referred to, what kind of terms are harmful. Um, Maybe there's historical context also that could help um, from different groups help you understand why maybe you know they want to use the term queer now, although it may have been problematic in the past. Or um, so yeah. So here we have an article from 
the American Psychological Association just about style and grammar. Um, about bias, bias-free language. Um, and then the second, the second work by Gabrielle Foreman just completely, completely helped us write the enslavement of our guides, uh, of our guide, because we all were not <laughs> scholars of, about of enslavement. Uh, having somebody who was, you know, reading this uh, document basically was our entire inspiration. And this was originally for teaching about slavery, which, and it was about writing too, which we are, we are writers in a way, you know, you are writing a biographical note, an abstract, a scope and content. So, uh, and then of course, Laura Hart's work at UNC with the conscious um, editing. This is a great video that she created about the conscious language for a Jim Crow archive. I suggest uh, you go and watch this when you have time, um, just to know the kind of work that she is doing up there and that they're, they're all doing up there. Uh, the Safe Zone Project Glossary. Um, so that's a great resource um, directly from a, a group who is dedicated to creating safe spaces for LGBTQ people. And then um, this was the, the session, the SAA session toward totally comp culturally, toward culturally competent archival redescription of marginalized histories. So really great SAA session um, that at least got me interested into this work and is a really great um, first step to learn more about this. And then I just wanted to add more things that we didn't necessarily use as a group, but things that I know are out there and there's a ton of other things, but just, I love work by Michelle Caswell. She's always talking about human rights in the archives and how we can kind of center uh, marginalized people in the archives. Uh, and then this work by uh, Dunbar, is talking about how we can bring in critical race theory, which I think a lot of our work, a lot of a lot of the research that is out there might uh, start with theory and not really telling you how to do anything, which is of course it's a uh, it's it it comes with it comes with the writing, but it can be a pet peeve that you know, you're reading all this theory about how we should do this with no explanation about how to do it. So I think that's a great article. And then uh, confronting our failure of care around legacies of marginalized people in archives is just, I think, a great um, article to, that everyone should read just to get thinking about what marginalized groups are being affected in your repository. Um, so just some basic thing I, you know, ideas to get you started is um, ask around, you know, email your friends at other um, universities or, uh, you know, churches or any other repository that's out there and ask them what they're doing if they're doing something like this and if they have any advice for you, um, if they have any research that they found helpful be expansive, look outside of libraries and look for things, uh, look for research that wasn't specifically written by librarians. Um, you know, look at museums, look at uh, uh, advocacy groups, question what you find. So confront the research with, you know, your critical mind and, um, you know, find research that counters it if you can. If you can't, then maybe that's just what you, where you need to be. Read and discuss this work if you can. You know, Emory um, at the Rose Library, the collection services has a great reading group that they read and discuss. I want to say about once a month, um, maybe a little bit less, maybe a little bit more um, at UNC. The conscious editing folks have a, a reading 
and discuss. And I, I know that's not possible for everybody, especially when it starts to get busy, when classes start up, um, or maybe you're the only one working in your archive. It may be more difficult to do that, to find someone to discuss with. Um, but you could always read and make your own notes, but keep track of what you find because um, when it's time for you to sit down and really get writing for your guide, um, you'll have all these things from the research that would be helpful. Um, so I wanted to get into how the guide was created, um, kind of what really, I really just want to talk about each of the sections. Um, but I will talk about right before the guide was created, what sort of went into effect, which were, was some language put into the finding aids to let uh, researchers know that they might encounter something um, that could be offensive or harmful. So that's this language here. So we have a regular processing note at the top and then that language is included right below it that this finding aid may include language that is offensive or harmful. Please refer to the harmful language statement for more information about why this language may appear um, and effort and, and learn about the efforts um, to remediate racist, ableist, sexist, homophobic, euphemistic and other oppressive language and an option to email the Rose Library. And then, Another great thing, which this isn't necessary, necessarily referring to um, the harmful language, but just more of an in general feedback form, which I think um, had already been in existence way before this work was started. Um, but it's a great option, I think, to give pay, uh, researchers the opportunity to give feedback and let you know, like, even if it's not something harmful, at least let you know you missed a couple commas there and maybe you should capitalize this or even just let you know maybe there's something not completely accurate. Um, and I, I don't know that everyone has a feedback form, but it may be a way to streamline instead of flushing your email. So um, something that's important about creating these guides creating guidelines for yourself is keeping in mind what's important for you. So for us at the Rose Library, we determined that at least for this first pass, we wanted to have a section of guidelines about gender, a section about sexuality, a section about enslavement, a section about race and ethnicity, and then um, a religion section, which has is still in the works. And, and you may find that other things come up um, as you as, as the guidelines start getting used. Um, so yeah, whenever you are thinking about, oh, I want to have guidelines at my own um, institution, then you might think we have a lot of holdings about the Civil War, maybe you specifically have a section about the Civil War rather than um, something else. You know, maybe you start with that. Um, and and that's, that's completely fine. That's what would work for you. And I think that it's important to tailor this to your collections. So this is, you know, the beginning of, uh, I'm not gonna read all of this, but this is, the first section of the guidelines is just a general principles. Um, this was written by Sarah and Carrie together. They um, created this and then we all went through several passes of editing. So we, um, they worked on it together and edited. Then as a group, we all looked over it, edited, and then we shared it more generally. And that rings true for all the sections. So. This just covers some general things that people um, should keep in mind that would would go over, maybe you could say this in each of the sections and it ended up here in the general. And it also talks about a revision cycle. It acknowledges uh, you know, our understanding of 
race and gender and sexuality is true to us right now, that might not be true to us in 10, 20 years, who knows? And the same thing with our language, it might be changed. So then we follow up that section with a section about race and ethnicity. Um, and we, we structured all of these with the same um, three subsections, which is principles to consider, preferred terms and languages, uh, language to avoid. Um, we actually first saw that in the Gabrielle Foreman um, writing, and we just uh, liked how, how that was divided up. Um, we had describing enslavement and colonization section, which once again, um, greatly afforded to us by Gabrielle Foreman's writing. We have the describing sexuality section. Um, and you see it's in the same structure, describing gender. So just some general tips about that. Figure out what you need. Um, you know, tailor this to your repository. Um, you know, go through a multi-level review process. Get as many eyes on it as you can. Um, you know, outside of yourself and your writing partner or your group. And it is great to have writing partners if it's possible. I know that it's not that some folks are working alone, but maybe you share it with someone at another institution, a colleague that you work with. Um, and I think it's great if you have a graduate student that is being paid well enough to get their perspective on it, because I think that, um, you know, students who are still in library school or maybe they're in another discipline, they're still learning, then they, they have a perspective, maybe you're closer to the reading and the research. So I think it's great to get a student perspective and just have a willingness to be an editor on an ongoing basis. Um, you know, keep in mind that um, this is gonna need updated. This is a living document and um, give yourself some structure with sections and subheadings. I think it makes it easier to break things down. Maybe it feels less overwhelming whenever you break things down into different sections. So just as a review in general, keep in mind that research is our friend. Um, it may feel overwhelming thinking, oh, I have to do a whole research project and read things and take notes and talk to people. But um, in the long run, it's going to be uh, more helpful to have done that research and have, you know, you know, things to fall back on. It even could help you advocate for yourself saying, well, um, I'm doing this because I read this work by Michelle Caswell and this just seemed like the answer. Um, so that is a possibility. Um, you know, keep in mind all the writing and the editing. Um, share the guide with as many people as you can and then get into using it. Start remediating things or start using it when you create a new collection um, and, you know, collaborate. Um, so yeah, that, that, that is it for me. Um, feel free to um, contact me if you need resources. I have a lot of things that I keep track of with this and um, yeah, thank you for listening. I'm so sorry about my dog. Hopefully it wasn't too disruptive to your learning experience, um, but I will hand it back over to Laura and Beth. Thank you so much, Tira. I think we're gonna go right into Beth here. So um, thank you so much, Tira. That was really um, a great presentation. Um, and thank you, Laura, so much for your introduction and going through some terms and things. Um, and thank you all for coming this afternoon. Um, so I'm going to talk about um, antidepressive cataloging um, and some of the work that's going on at Emory, just to sort of think about how um, these things might be seen in your catalog as well. So just a, a brief bit about me. Um, I am uh, somebody who understands that cataloging, like archival description, is not neutral. Um, we curate, we describe, and we use language that we have inherited, um, as well as language that we try and create um, 
to to label and to name those things. Um, I am the co-chair for the Code of Ethics um, Steering Committee, um, which we'll talk about that before we're done. Um, <laughs> I am deeply committed to collections and to bringing them to people, which is why we have collections. Um, and uh, I am, uh, uh, yeah, well, the car cartoon probably speaks for itself. Uh, and I will admit I didn't put the credit on there, but I stole it from Brendan Bichowski, who is also a rare books cataloger. So at Rose Library, we have um, four main collecting areas. Um, and, and maybe even reading through this, you see that um, there might be some areas where description is difficult, um, especially uh, sort of the, the, um, the boundaries between Southern history and culture and African-American history and culture, um, as well as actually would shockingly poetry and literature <laughs> um, and our rare books. Uh, we also collect artist books. So um, those sometimes um, are difficult to describe and label um, in meaningful ways. So what kind of issues do we even have in catalog, right? It's just, you just record stuff and there it is, right? Just like archival processing. No, um, just a few things. So um, some of these things are some updates on, which is very exciting. You may have heard of the movie Change the Subject. This is about um, the Dartmouth students who um, did the work to submit new subject headings to replace a legal alien and um, uh, at the time, this, um, you may remember this, um, it went to the Library of Congress and they approved it. And then Congress, who probably doesn't understand anything about knowledge organization, got involved and said, no, you can't, you, you can't change these. Um, the Library of Congress declined during the Trump administration to forward any of these again through their process. Um, but happily, um, in 2021, in the spring, they did. So now, um, we have the pleasure in the Library of Congress subject headings of instead of using aliens um, as a term for people, we have um, undocumented uh, people and illegal Im immigration, I believe, are the two. So there are, there's progress. Um, but this is an interesting, you can watch this on PBS for free. It's quite interesting. And it's a great um, example of people getting really involved in this, right? This was students who did this work, not librarians. Um, so other things can can be dependent on your um, institution. So this is a, there's this great article by Dan Cas Ken Cassiato, a little bit older now, but um, he, he worked for an institution that asked him to reclass creationism texts into their science classifications and sort of the way he met that challenge um, and talking about sort of the aims of your organization and the aims of you personally and where those can conflict and um, and mesh. So that's also really, um, I think that's still, I, I know from my own experience that um, I have reclassified things for a variety of reasons, sometimes when requested and sometimes not when requested. Um, so another thing we know about LCSH is it's not great about naming people. They are doing work to change that. Many people are doing work to change that. Um, for example, um, the um, indigenous subject headings. So um, many people, um, especially in Canada, in Oregon, and some other places, are working really hard to um, to create subject headings um, where we can name people accurately. So not Indians of North America, but um, specific tribal groups that we can name. Um, when we're cataloging your resources or doing archival description um, on those kinds of collections. Um, another thing that really shows up a lot, I think, in the US is um, the cataloging of, this is sp specifically Spanish and Portuguese, but I think non-English language cataloging can be a real um, problem for a lot of institutions that maybe don't have language expertise or um, where, where workers pretend, prefer to do English because um, it goes faster and their stats are higher um, because we know that there are plenty of institutions that measure success on um, statistics, not actual quality. <laughs> um, and so um, there have been a number of really interesting time studies um, about how long it takes non-English language materials to get cataloged and shelved uh, compared to English language materials. Um, so this kind of access is another really important 
um, thing to consider when we're looking at the kind of resources that we're trying to make available. Um, and then, you know, there's authority work. So how we choose to name people, how we choose to mark them as unique. Um, this is an article from 2014 about how um, in authority records, if you were going to mark gender, you had to choose male or female or other. Um, there are better options now um, in authority work happily. So um, this article kind of kicked off a real effort to get those things, get that, that term list um, changed. So I guess um, the, the great news about that is that when we do the work, we see change. Yeah, we have to enfranchise a lot of people and it takes time, but we see change. So I do want to talk about the Cataloging Code of Ethics. This is a great tool um, to use in technical services generally. Um, it's not super specific to um, cataloging entirely, but and I know that of course um, SAA also has an ethics statement, um, which we did study pretty extensively when we were working on this. Um, so this code of ethics was written by um, uh, well, we enfranchised um, working groups. We, we had working groups that covered four continents and about 100 people. Um, and they wrote reports for the steering committee, which is made up of, um, of women, six women, um, from the UK, the US, and Canada. Um, and then using that feedback, that information, um, and two open comment periods, we came up with the final code of ethics um, that was uh, released in January of 2021, which is about six months later than we wanted to release it. But guess what? Uh, global pandemics are bad for um, <laughs> timely releases of information. Um, so you can find it in the um, at this at this address in the um, ALA Institutional Repository. So just briefly, the principles um, and. and these I think can um, guide a lot of work. There's also a, an introduction that I would recommend that you read. Um, but we catalog resources um, in our collections with the end user in mind to facilitate access and pro promote discovery. That's just as basic a statement as we could come up with about cataloging. Um, we commit to describing resources with, without discrimination whilst respecting the privacy and preferences of their associated agents. We acknowledge that we bring our biases. This one's really um, important, I think, for this particular webinar. Um, we acknowledge that we bring our biases to the workplace because we all have biases. Um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, and we strive to overcome personal, institutional, and societal prejudices in our work. Um, so we wanted to acknowledge that it wasn't just what I feel, it's also what my institution puts out and what society um, shapes us to be or tries to shape us to be. Um, we, uh, we recognize that interoperability and consistent application of standards help our users find and access materials, but standards are biased. Um, we've already talked about how LCSH is biased um, and we advocate uh, to critically make cataloging more inclusive both um, in the workplace and with our with our words. We support um, efforts to make standards and tools financially and intellectually accessible. Um, anybody who's worked with RDA knows that it's an expensive thing to keep up. Um, we take responsibility for our cataloging decisions and advocate for transparency in our institutional practices and policies. This is another thing that, that Tiara was talking about, right, with the antioppressive um, language guidelines. Um, we collaborate widely to support creation, distribution, maintenance, and enrichment of metadata. We insist on diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace. We promote education, training, equitable pay, and fair work environment for everyone who catalogs so they can continue to support research and, um, research and discovery. Um, we advocate for the value of cataloging work, and we work with our user committees to understand their needs and provide relevant and timely services. So those are the 10 principles we came up there. They do not come in any particular order. Um, they are numbered in the document, but um, they, they all have sort of equal importance to us. So at Emory, we've been doing um, some things, uh, among other things, we have been sort of working with the code of ethics um, and grappling with that. Ethics and, and repetitive work um, is not simple. It's not uncomplicated. It, um, 
is, as Laura mentioned, it's a process of becoming comfortable with being uncomfortable. Um, I'm eternally thankful for my colleagues on the steering committee for uh, the document, for, for making me uncomfortable, for pointing out where um, my biases uh, were, were at play. Um, so uh, I just want to acknowledge that none of this work is easy, but I think as we've seen already, that all of this work is important. So among other things, um, and there's been a lot of talk about this sort of in the library world, we are working on subject heading remediation. It's a little more complicated than um, it is a, than it might be at first glance. For example, um, it's easy to change the word alien as a, as a class of people, as a group of people, but you can't just blanket change the word alien in your entire vocabulary because there's also alien abduction. Um, reports on, on kidnapping by aliens, and also things like alien plants, so plants that um, aren't uh, indigenous to an ecosystem. So if you just replace alien with, um, say, undocumented person, um, then you have undocumented person abduction, which is really not what we're trying to say with that term. So um, so if you're thinking about um, separate heading remediation mapping into your, into your discovery layer, um, with different terms than might be in the record itself. Just remember to sort of think about all the places that that, that occurs. Um, unfortunately, uh, our head of metadata, um, Sylvia Slitskaya, is doing um, a great job of this work and really thinking through um, some of these complications with her team. So um, based actually on the work that was done by the task force in Rose, we also have a harmful language in the catalog um, uh, statement. Um, and uh, this, I mean, we really started out with a rose um, language that Tiara and the other um, team members worked on um, because it was so uh, very well thought through and written. So um, our humble language in the catalog statement, uh, which you can find at this link, um, is not dissimilar. Um, and so uh, it's a way to commit as catalogers to um, working through to um, work against this language. And we also have a, a comment um, form that's at the bot linked to the bottom of the page for people to, to um, send us revisions and thoughts and um, uh, to point out harmful language we may have missed. There we go. Um, I want to point out a really great uh, resource. This is going to come up a couple times before I'm done. There is a site called the Cataloging Lab. It's really easy, cataloginglab.org. Um, that has amazing resources. So Cataloging Lab started out as a way to sort of crowdsource changes in subject headings because um, it can be a lot of time and research involved in changing a subject heading. So um, it was a way to gather uh, people who catalog to and, and other librarians um, to really think about what terms are there and how we might change them. But it's really grown to be this amazing and wonderful um, resource of all sorts of things. Um, so you see that there's um, uh, a list of statements about bias in the library and archives and also some problem LCSH. Um, oops, sorry, I got ahead of myself. We'll talk about this a little bit later. But um, the really important thing here is that um, it's great for research, this list of metadata departments, um, or sorry, uh, statements on bias in the library and archives is huge and growing. I mean, there's, I think there's probably 50 or 60 statements on there. So if you're looking to see what other institutions have done, um, it's a great resource. Um, and it's, I know there are Canadian institutions, I don't know, I can't remember off the top of my head because it changes so much um, with new um, institutions, whether they're ones from other countries as well. Um, it also has this great list of problem LCSH and some of the mappings that they're proposing um, and um, the opportunity to suggest a new heading um, and uh, to work on that collaboratively. collaboratively. Um, I wanna talk about a project that my colleagues at Pitt's Theology Library did. Um, and this, depending on the size of your library could be either a very large or a very small project. Um, I think it was sort of medium uh, at um, Pitt's, but this work was carried out um, by Brenda Michael and some of uh, the other colleagues at Pitt's, but it was spearheaded by Brenda. And um, these slides are uh, pulled from a presentation that she did about this project. So they wanted to change um, all their materials that have end cutters and for Negro um, 
and uh, even the even the Library of Congress has said, yeah, these these aren't great. Let's let's work this out. Um, so they started out with some some resources that are here, um, including a pretty uh, extensive list of um, where those occur. And then um, they used um, uh, they they went through and figured out where those books are. They came up with the catalog information. Um, and the identifier over there on the right, as well as the barcode, um, and where they might be, so that they could pull them and change them. So what they discovered is they had 500 items from 20 different classes um, at Pitts, and then they also we have a um, remote storage air well not remote but we have a, a library service center. So they also had materials held at the library service center, which is a separate process of pulling them and having them available to change. And so this is a process they went through. Um, once they had identified them, they uh, added the new um, uh, call number with the uh, um, corrected um, cutter. They updated their holdings. They pulled the book. They checked the barcode. They put a new label on it, and they reshelved it. Um, I think this is a project that took them about three or four months to manage with their collections. So I do want to talk briefly about other ways we can name things. Um, yes, LCSH has this primacy and this supposed national importance. Um, and there's a whole history behind that that we haven't really got time for today. But um, it's not the only thing you can use. And I realize that different shops may be sort of wed to LCSH, either historically or through leadership. But it's important to be aware that there are other options. So um, other vocabularies that we use at Rose um, are the Getty, Art and Architecture Thesaurus, um, and the RBMS vocabulary. Both of these are more about what it, what the artifact is of the book, less about content, um, although there, there are some um, genre headings in the RBMS vocabularies. Um, Homosaurus, which if you don't know this, this is a great resource um, for uh, recording uh, all sorts of topics related to LGBTQIA plus kinds of resources. Um, and I will say that uh, all three of these vocabularies that are mentioned here at the top are all linked data ready. So if you're using them, they have identifiers. And if that's something that your um, library is, is working towards, um, that, is, that is happening. Um, and then um, <laughs> The Mashtanakit Pequot um, Thesaurus of American Indian Terminology Project, there's an article about this if you look up this title. Um, as of January, it was still in draft form. I am not sure which direction it's going, but I really deeply hope that it gets tested and turned into a vocabulary, even if it's not linked data ready, because I think um, that they have used some really great um, work and basis to, their, to this vocabulary, and then I, I want it to be usable. Um, so also this, this list is from the cataloging lab. Um, and you can follow all these um, all these links to different kinds of vocabularies. There's a lot of, if you have zines, there's a zine thesaurus, which is amazing. Um, and so there's there's lots of different um, um, opportunities to, to both learn from these and use them if your library is willing um, to, to go out on a little bit of a limb to better describe resources for your users. So that's a lot. Between me and Tierra, um, that's a lot. Um, a lot of information, a lot of thoughts. Um, you don't have to do everything at once, right? Um, this, is, this is, as Tierra mentioned, an iterative process. So we do it we do it now, we do it again in six months or a year or five years, however that works out for institutions. Um, but you don't have to do it all at one time. You can choose your project strategically for your institutional goals, staffing and impact. Staffing is also really important in this. Um, maybe you're a sole person. Maybe you have three people, but they're all really um, overwhelmed with work. I mean, you know, that never happens in, in library and archives. Um, <laughs> So to really think about what you can achieve with who you have um, and go for go for impact, right? Like what is the best thing, what is the best case scenario you could create and how can you create that um, with, with the tools and, and resources that you have? Lean on other institutions, right? 
everybody's happy to share. You know, if you want to talk with Sophia about how we're doing the um, the subject heading mapping, she will tell you all about it. She will send you resources. She'll be excited that other people um, know and and are interested. Um, so if other institutions are doing things that you know about and and are interested in, contact them. Um, make that make that connection. Work together. Maybe between. Um, your institution and their institution, you can um, come up with better, you know, a better project or, or more impact or, um, you know, and help each other out and share successes and lessons, um, both with those with other institutions, but at places like SGA, um, on listservs and things like that. Um, if you have successes or you learn something that you need to change or do differently, um, they will be super happy to learn those things and not have to like find those pitfalls themselves. So I really um, recommend that you um, that you continue that you work through networks, right? None of us is, even though sometimes we feel very alone, none of us is actually alone in, in our professions and we can we can work together to improve these situations for sure. Um, and Tierra did a great job of of pointing that out as well. So I think we have a break now, but um, you have earned gratuitous pet photos at this point in time. I will say that um, when Tierra Zelda was barking, Cora was running around the house trying to figure out where that dog was. Um, so um, uh, I will um, quit sharing and then I think we're probably about at a break. Yes, we are at a break. Hello everyone. Um, I think we're going to get started in just a little bit um, with the Q&A. Um, we do have some questions that have been submitted, and we would love to hear more. Um, after that, we'll go into the breakout rooms. We have two, one in which um, Tara will lead about starting the creation of your own um, anti-oppressive policy document, um, the other um, reviewing how to approach uh, problematic cataloging issues. Um, we have reached the time that uh, we're starting the Q&A. So, there we go, Q&A, and we can open this up if anyone would like to uh, ask questions. Um, one of the first questions that was asked was, how do you maintain historical context while also using anti-oppressive language? Um, they have one of the three parts. Um, they recently had discovered that some of their files use the term oriental as a race. And that knowing that this is oppressive language today, how do we find that balance between being historically correct while also being respectful? I think that's a great question. Um, I think it, I mean, like all things in archives, it depends. I think maybe, you know, there's an easy way that uh, people have been talking about you know, keeping existing language, and that's just putting things in quotes. Um, you know, you can add more language to it and say, you know, this term we've used here um, because that's what, you know, the donor had done. That's what, you know, an archivist had done when this collection was created. That's the language that was normalized when this collection was created. And we kept it here because we didn't want to remove any important historical context. So I think it's really just the best thing you can do if you wanna keep something like that is contextualize it, let people know that it's there and let them know why you decided to keep it. And, uh, you know, just don't try to hide it, basically. <laughs> just draw the eye toward it, eye, eye toward it and, let everybody know why it's important. And I think that that's the best you can do. Yes, you're muted. Trying to not talk over here. Um, um, I, I completely agree. I think a lot of um, the work that we can do is saying, these were choices that were made by people before us for these specific reasons, we acknowledge it. And, and this is, you know, this is what our rationale is for including this language. Um, and I think that is, that goes a long way. I think also it's important to point out that both in the Rose Harmful Language Statement and in the um, 
cataloging a harmful language statement, there are some caveats, right? Like we can't change what things were titled, right? If there's a title on something, we record that. And those, I think this is true in archival work too, right? Um, if they use the term, if they use an outdated term, then that is what the title of the work is. But how we then choose to maybe apply LCSH or whatever vocabulary we're using to describe um, those records, um, you know, we may be able to do some, some mitigation um, there. And uh, anybody who's coming to my breakout later, we're gonna we're gonna look at one of those. Um, so I think, yeah, I think transparency goes a long way. And people can quibble with what you chose, but if you're saying we made this choice because, then at least you're not being like, oh, we're not gonna look at that. Um, which is is the important thing here, I think. As someone who uses the document that Sierra created um, at, at Emory, <clears throat> one of the uh, things that we always kind of focus on is, you know, we're not changing the actual documents. You know, if someone used the term Oriental as a, a race in their own letters, we are not going to change that. Um, we will acknowledge that it's there, um, but a lot of the work that we're doing is talking about how we are describing it, the, the, the finding aids, our documentation, our access points. Um, and I know that at Emory, we have the ability to create um, file level notes. Um, there are processing notes almost at every level of our, um, our finding aid arrangement. So it can be at the collection level, it can be at the series level, we can also do it at the file level, um, just um, to acknowledge it as best said, you know, confronting it and saying this is this is how it exists and this is what we've done and why is much better than pretending like we didn't see it. Has anyone come up against this in their own work or has this spurred any other questions about something that they've come, in, come involved with? Come involved with? This is Tamika. I actually submitted the question because uh, one of my colleagues, we were looking at materials and I work for the Georgia Archives, and we were looking at some um, government records that included the various races from the 1960s, I think it was, in Oriental. Well, for the longest time, um, a lot of the government agencies only recognized two races, white and colored, or white and Negro, white and Black. And so when we saw that, we were like, oh, it's a different um, category, but we know that if we wrote up a description of it now, it will be problematic if we use that term. So that's the reason why I asked that question. I mean, that sounds super important, like historically. So I think definitely when you write up the description, just adding that context in there, would I think that would make it a great way to share it. Yeah, your answers were very helpful and I actually made notes of that. So thank you very much for sharing that. You're uh, muted, Laura. <laughs> but it's still picking up. Asking the... if anybody else had questions <laughs> that they would like addressed. I have a question. Hi, so I'm Gabby Hale. I'm at Mercer. Um, and I put this question in the Slido, but I figured I might as well just say it out loud. Um, so we here at Mercer are in the process of standardizing and creating finding aids and adding everything into archive space for the first time. So it's kind of pulling from dozens of different formats like Word documents or just like handwritten lists and boxes. Um, and part of our collection is a large group of Georgia Baptist um, church records. And um, so we're trying to add those as subjects into archive space. And we have a few situations where there's two churches with the same name in the same town. So like First Baptist Church of Macon in Macon, Georgia, um, but one was historically white and the other black. And so we're trying to figure out how to describe that in a way in the subjects. Um, that way it's respectful, but also like the descendants of attendants of the black church can find their correct First Baptist Macon. So does anyone else have like things that have come up across like this? And are none of the, none of these churches are established as like name authorities? Nope. No, not <laughs> no. So we're making all of this in our um, local language. I I mean, Tara will know more because she's the archivist and I'm a cataloger. But um, I wonder about um, you know it gets obnoxious if you use it so much. But I wonder if you can denote that one of them is maybe you denote it by address. 
or yeah. some other like unique identifier for that church. Mm -hmm. And then you can say historically white and historically black if those are important. And I'm sure they are mm -hmm. um, things to, to note about these two churches in the same town because we know about history of the South, right? Yes. Um, so exactly. um, yeah, I wonder if there's a way that you can, even just the street name, because mm -hmm. hopefully they weren't on the same street. Um, <laughs> You never know. Uh, that, that might be my solution. Um, Tara, do you have thoughts? Yeah, um, I was actually going to cite a couple different guidelines that I know have been created. The um, folks at UNC doing the conscious editing, I believe they set up a rule where they were, uh, well, I know that they set up a rule. They started rewriting abstracts and including white. Um, mm -hmm as an identifier before a person's name in the same way that oftentimes we, you know, point out when someone is black because they did something important. And that's mm -hmm. the only time that we point out race is when they're a person of color, especially when they're black. So, and I, at Emory, we had at least decided, um, well, we didn't really decide on a rule like that at Emory, but I do think, um, I don't think there's a problem with, uh, saying historically black and historically white and pointing them out that way. Um, other people might have a different opinion, but that's honestly what I think I would do. And I think we were at UNC at the same time. Yeah, yeah. we were. I was going to say that. <laughs> yeah, good to see you. But hopefully that's helpful. It is. Yeah, we just wanted more input than just the three of us because it, it was only three of us here. So we wanted to hear as well as other uh, places with maybe some church records as well or yeah so thank you this is helpful um there is another question in um slido but to make it you have your camera on so i didn't know if you had another follow-up question would like to ask that no i just figured i would turn it on since um it might be good to put a face with a name but i was um gonna say to gabby that historically black and historically white churches is a good way to describe it because I'm looking at it from a researcher's standpoint because I'm a genealogist and so for us we definitely want to know you know when we do a search whether it's the black church or it's the white church and the thing about a lot of this research from a genealogical perspective is that being in the south and a lot of the records being segregated and I know that as an archivist as well we've been kind of trained to know that if this there, if there is no race designation in front of the title of the item, to assume it's white, or it could be mixed. But mm -hmm. if you're looking for um, the color book or the color section, you have to look in certain places for that. Like you have to look for the separate colored books or the color tax digest, the colored mar marriage books. So those are ways that um, researchers are also looking for terms as well. And so I also asked a question about <laughs> changing the terms because for me as a researcher I've trained myself to know that to kind of be familiar with what time frame I'm looking at based off of the terms that were used to describe African Americans so if I know if I see slave I know I'm thinking of course antebellum if I see colored is also the antebellum going into Jim Crow if I see Negro that's another time frame if I see Afro-American that's another time frame so sometimes these terms for researchers designate times um, in history because those are the terms that were used historically to describe certain groups. And so um, that's why I asked the question about Oriental because of course they were referred to as Orientals, but today that's not a good term. For me, Negro is not an offensive term, but I know some people who are like, don't call me Negro, don't call me colored. So I can understand that. But for me as a researcher, when I see those terms or hear those terms, I automatically think a certain time frame or a time period in history. Um, I do want to get one more question in. Uh, that's probably going to be for you, but um, Jenny Oldfield asks, are there any suggested resources for mapping subject headings? Um, so there are is on Cataloging Lab um, a list of problematic subject headings, some of which have suggestions um, for uh, revised subject headings. Um, and so that can be really helpful um, to start with that. And some of those revised subject headings are also available now in, um, in the Library of Congress. 
I, I'll just point out that um, I know sometimes the Library of Congress seems to move very slow and like not have their stuff together, but the subject heading office at the Library of Congress is staffed by two people. And two people, is, I mean, there's an editorial board that reviews new um, uh, submissions, but as far as maintaining all this huge thesaurus, it's only two people. So um, I always try and take it with a grain of salt when they don't, <laughs> when they don't move as quickly as I'd like them to, to get things done. Um, so um, yeah, so I would I would um, suggest that that going to Catalan Lab, and then um, I can provide um, uh, Sophia's email if anybody. I mean, I, I feel okay about this. Um, if anybody is interested in in seeing how she's going about um, identifying things that should be mapped. Thank you. I appreciate it. This is Jenny. Um, I was just thinking also about headings that we might want to address by mapping or some other some other ways. Um, but the flip side is that sometimes researchers come at it with a heading in mind that's that's problematic too. And how do you how do you both map something and um, and also in, in some way include it? I don't know, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So the the advantage of mapping is that we're not changing anything in the record. So um, uh, we'll use the, the Oriental example since it's already come up. So if we map um, Oriental to a different term that's maybe, you know, maybe we do the work to figure out which, um, you know, which country we're, or which region we're talking about, um, the word Oriental is gonna stay in the record. We're just mapping it. So that means that if a researcher comes in and looks for materials with the word Oriental as a separate heading, they're going to find them, right? So they'll still come up in the search um, if that specific heading is searched. But generally, um, uh, if somebody looks for um, Asians or Asian Americans or um, maybe Cambodians or Lao or something like that, that that term will come up as well. As identifying the same resource, um, so that's the the advantage of mapping versus sort of doing a thoroughgoing change in subject headings. Which um, I don't know how big your collection is, but that just makes my head hurt to even think about. <laughs> so, um, and the the advantage of mapping too is that as things change, you can change the map, right? You don't have to go through and change all the records again. Um, you can always change the map, and you can change one term in most maps. Um, Beth, so that has some advantages going forward. Beth, I'm going to jump in here because we have gotten to the end of our very short Q&A. Um, and I want to make sure that we have time to go through our the, the projects that we have set up for the breakout groups. Um, we do have, as I said, two breakout groups. One will be working with Kiara to, to start the um, creation of your own anti-oppressive policies, um, language policies. And the other one will be with Beth going into like identifying how to approach um, problematic uh, cataloging Welcome back, everybody. I hope you all had very successful breakout sessions and learned a lot and communicated a lot and built relationships. Um, this is the part of the session that is wrap up. So I'd like to give the opportunity to my, my presenters um, to talk about things they want to make sure everyone leaves knowing or understanding or keeps in mind. Uh, I guess I could go first. Let's see. Um, yeah, I think just uh, the main, I mean, what we talked about, I guess, in our, our breakout session is just some additional information is to just uh, think about all the stakeholders in your collecting areas and um, just think about you know what their identity is and what subjects come up when you think about your collecting areas and how can you kind of turn those into sections for your own guide or just things that you want to research more to make sure that you're knowledgeable on in case something comes up for you um, and when you sort of break it down like that that might help you narrow down some resources or kind of what you want to tackle first. So it's not some big overwhelming project of 
kind of having to, you know, fix everything in the world at once, you know, do a little bit at a time. Um, and yeah, we just, uh, I, I think that's the main takeaway is don't try to do everything all at once and um, uh, just break things down for yourself and um, do your research and your, you know, collaborate as much as you can. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll let Beth go ahead and share. Um, I think one of the things that we talked about, which was great, is um, someone was really interested in mapping subject headings, and that can be a really daunting project simply because, um, you know, at Emory, we have lots of resources to throw at things. Um, we have lots of people. We have a systems department. We have, you know, um, uh, lots of people who are doing lots of work, but also um, some different departments that we can leverage to do things like that. So one of the things that um, one person in our breakout suggested is that um, they sort of flowed the idea of adding local subject headings. Um, so uh, not not having to map the subject headings that exist, but adding your own um, controlled vocabulary or your own um, kind of sub separate subject headings to a record to sort of mitigate some of that. Um, and I thought that was, you know, exactly the kind of creative thinking that is really important in this kind of work, whether it's writing a harmful language statement or trying to figure out how to mitigate things in finding aids and catalog records is that sometimes you you kind of work within a system and sometimes you just have to be like, okay, that's the system and this is what I'm going to, we're going to figure out how to do it this way. And I think that, um, I think when you're doing reparative and antidepressive work, like some of that is super important to just be like, well, this isn't going to work. We don't, we don't have these resources, even though that's the ideal scenario. So let's, toss those all in the garbage can and do it this way. Um, and I think as if that works for your users, um, then then I say, go for it. Like, I think that's a great way to, to um, approach things is to think outside the box. One other thing I would just wanna say really quick that we talked about that, um, I hadn't anticipated so much was talking about, you know, dealing with the administration um, and advocating for yourself. So um, I think, you know, just be willing to advocate for yourself, to push for the work that you want to be doing and you think is important. Um, I know it's really difficult when you, you know, some of us work with um, really strict administrative folks who are not really on the same page with the mission that the library has, um, which might be forwarding social justice justice in some way. And that's not always what they're thinking about. Um, so yeah, I think be willing to advocate for yourself, you know, point to workshops like this and resources that we talked about and say like, these people are doing this work. And if we want to be an upstanding institution who um, is keeping up with the current trends, we need to be doing this too. You know, just be willing to say that for yourself because, you know, if this is what you want to be doing, you you deserve that. So I completely agree. And um I, I think we should never be above like benchmarking with peer institutions. Um, because that one's a big motivator for for outside library administrators. And I think also like don't be afraid to leverage buzzwords. Right, like we don't have to internalize that, but if if you need to talk to some upper administrator and you need to say like um, anti-racist or whatever the buzzwords that your institution are to get this work sort of um, greenlighted, then I, you know <laughs> within boundaries, I'm not. I think that's completely fair, right? Like the the difficulty with advocating sometimes is we have to take ourselves out of our own language and use. The kind of language that that university presidents or uh, or um, you know head librarians or head archivists or things like that um, maybe understand or can translate to their supervisors too. So um, yeah, I completely agree. Advocacy advocacy is hard, but sometimes it's because it requires us to to use vocabularies that we're not comfortable in. I'm willing to throw out um, any final thoughts that 
anyone else who is participating in today's workshop would be interested in to bring up maybe thoughts for moving forward or ideas for the future or things they thought were inherently interesting and wanted to make sure everyone else heard them too? If not, we could probably end a little early. Um, I do want to give um, Mike Sandrock a, a chance to talk about upcoming uh, education events as the uh, Education Committee Chair. I'm putting him on the spot right now, um, but he doesn't have to, if he doesn't want to. Um, any information, sorry, if any information can be found on the website, but Mike, you're here, so would you like to say something? Yeah. Well, so we don't have anything set in stone, but we will have two um, pre, SGA annual conference workshops coming up in the fall. Watch your emails. Um, and as uh, Laura said, um, check our um, website for any, for under the events and education tab, those, those will be updated as those dates come forward. I also wanna thank you, Laura, for moderating and putting this together. And on behalf of the rest of the education committee, Beth and Tierra, wonderful to have you, it's quite an honor. Thank you both. Well, with that, I do wanna thank all the participants as well. Um, these workshops never do well without all of the um, input and engagement, as well as both Shady and Mike and um, Michelle, Michelle Melissa, um, um, who volunteered to help today and uh, take notes for us so we could uh, offer full engagement. So I wanna thank everybody um, who was here, who thought of this and um, I, all right, then. thank you so very much for joining us today.